Listen, if you didn't watch Hee Haw growing up, you don't get me. Oh. If you don't know Minnie <laughs> Pearl, you don't know me. The most intense moment in being a bomb tech, nothing happens. To the right side of my body, it blew me through the air. I landed on my back and my legs were gone. Our Father, who art in heaven, with liberty and justice for all, and we realized <laughs> in that moment, Line. you know, maybe we should have went to church a time or two. <laughs> <laughs> and I didn't think I had that in me, and I, I didn't, but I had my version of it, which was to tell a joke or keep the guy busy, focused on telling my mama I love her. You know, we've had this conversation on the podcast before, but once you, once you introduce donkeys into the mix, especially a miniature donkey, then you have to pause at least for a moment to ponder a mule and, of course, a jackass as well. There you and, go. And, and since you're the proud owner of at least some of those, I, I'd be remiss if I didn't ask you to very briefly uh, talk about the differences uh, betwixt the three. So what's funny is if I get stud jackasses, so if I get male intact donkeys mm -hmm. in my neighbors that have the horse farm, if they have female horses, we can have a problem. Mm -hmm. And cool. so but I, I don't remember which order, but if I believe a male donkey and a female horse make a mule mm -hmm. and then a male horse and a female donkey make a Hannah. Mm. And so a mule or a Hannah is a hybrid of a horse and a donkey. And they are sterile, so you can't make more of them, but they're the strongest and best animal. A lot of times you'll see like a like a, a grindstone mill, something that needs mm -hmm. torque. They'll use mules for that. Pulling a plow, you need a mule for that. Pound for pound strong. Mm. I just want to jump in to say this all tracks, Joey, because I know on your Instagram account, your pronouns are he and hall. <laughs> <laughs> so... This this makes perfect sense. Listen, if you didn't watch Hee Haw growing up, you don't get me. Oh. <laughs> if you don't know Minnie Pearl, you don't know me. Oh, yeah. I want to hear the story of what you did specifically in the core. A lot of people have seen Hurt Locker. A lot of people understand IEDs, EOD. There are a lot of acronyms with you guys. But <laughs> what exactly were you doing and why did you volunteer for that game. yeah that's a, that's a great way to ask that question there's a reason why you're a legend you are i guess um <laughs> so yeah hey listen i'll i'll butter the biscuit all day it just happens to be true and i happen to believe it um <laughs> listen you know when we're fighting this war in afghanistan or iraq before that 2003 is the best time to start this uh the first ied the first improvised explosive device that we all came to know as a roadside bomb goes off what is that? Well, it's like a landmine, but it's made out of homemade parts. Or it's like a landmine, but it's non-conventional. It means no two of them are the same. They're uniquely built. Well, why is that important? Because if you're going to defeat something and there's no standardization to it, you got to learn not just what a thing is, but what a thing can be. Not just what it's made out of, but what it can be made out of. So now you're going from specific tangible components to abstract functions. What can turn on a light? What can ring a bell? What can move a lever? Those are the things you're fighting now. Well, what can do that? Everything can do that. So what do you got to learn? A little bit of everything. You got to learn electronic engineering. You got to learn chem, uh, you got to learn um, chem and bio, chemical and biological weapons. You got to learn physics. You got to learn chemistry. You, you got to learn a little bit of it all, at least enough to know what's being used against you. Well, why do you do that? Because these improvised devices were the favored weapon of the enemy. They couldn't get a hold of enough AKs and they didn't have enough people to use them. But they could make a bunch of bombs, and if one of them went off, they accomplished their mission. And guerrilla warfare in the desert is basically the way to put it, or in the desert mountains. And so EOD, Explosive Ordnance Disposal, our job wasn't just to take bombs apart. It was to be the chess player, right? If we develop this tactic, the enemy developed that weapon. I got to see that coming so I can tell the guys, hey— they're going to use this bomb this way now. They're going to make this bomb function that way now. Every time you used to take a step right, now you got to take a step left because they're anticipating that step right. The responsibility that comes with that is amazing. Fulfillment isn't the word for it. To be able to influence the way men at war think in a way that keeps them alive, man, that's where it's at. You know, that was, that was the fulfillment. Walking down on the bomb that might kill me or take my legs the bravado in that's kind of like walking up that hill with two tones of brick. You know, if I do it right, nobody knows. Mm. You know, the, the only problem I have with the Hurt Locker is the most intense moment in being a bomb tech, nothing happens, right? You're leaning over, you're about to take an action, you take that action. If you do it right, it's all quiet. 
If you do it wrong, something happens. But the most intense moment is very quiet. People aren't shooting and stuff around you. It's you and what's in front of you and the knowledge you have of what could happen. And it's there's not fulfillment as much in that as there is taking the 30,000 foot view and saying, okay, I walk down on those bombs to collect data, to get information, to play this game of chess. So one day I don't even have to walk down on those bombs. Or one day I know my Marines won't even go near that bomb because they saw it from a mile away because I gave them the information and trained them to think. So how many the job, people, Joey, yeah. how many people are doing that job at any given time at the height of the conflict? In Afghanistan, in southern Afghanistan, which includes Marja, the Helmand province, um, where all the poppy was being grown and all the bad guys were hanging out, we had 86 of us in country, broken down into two-man teams, so about 40 two-man teams, and about 35 two-man teams spread around the country. Each two-man team was covering an area as far as you could walk in a day, and that's it. So it was a different war than Iraq. In Iraq, we could take six of us, cover the area of the 80 of us, because we could get in the truck and drive down a highway. Afghanistan didn't have trucks or highways for the most part where we were. Not just a and different so, war, but a very different war. People can flay Iraq and Iran, I mean, and Afghanistan all the time. Night yeah, day. it's a different place, different culture, different people, different enemy, different weapons for a different purpose. People don't know that, and that's okay. We fought really hard for them not to know it. Ignorance <laughs> isn't just bliss. It's paid for in blood, and that's just <laughs> part of it. But the job was to understand any way the enemy could use an explosive or a chemical biological hazard against us, anticipate it, and be prepared with minimal tools to eliminate it or render it safe. That was the job. What the hell happened? August 6th, was it? That's it, August 6th, 2010. Yeah. So the uniqueness of that date was extortion 17 happened uh, same day a year later. And, uh, and so it's just a date that lives in infamy for a bunch of reasons for me. But August 6th, 2010, uh, we call that our alive day. When you're blown up and you should have died, you know, after the bomb went off, I was bleeding out of three limbs, had a punctured lung. If people don't save me, I die. I am dying by fact in that moment. But I live, so that's my live day. For me, my live day comes with the pain of knowing the guy next to me died. And so that's the best way to explain war, you know. It's not fair. It's not even, it, it doesn't even make sense. It just is. And you either survive it or it kills you in the moment or years later. And so what happened that day is what happens to guys and gals a thousand, thousands of times in those two wars. Um, it's not all that exceptional other than the people that it hurt and changed. And so I always tell people what happened after that day is the important part. So what happened that day, I was responding to a call, responding to Marine engineers who were tasked with clearing a building in a road. They found parts of, a, of building bombs in this room because it was a storage facility. I don't mean to jumble my words here. But we were responding to a storage facility, and they were going in room by room of the storage facility and looking for something, and they finally found it, which was IED components. Now, they didn't find a room full of them because the bad guys knew we were coming, and they took all those components, and they made a minefield out of the town. So we cleared 207 IEDs in two square kilometers in two weeks. The first five days, I'd made it through 38 of them. On the sixth day, August 6, 2010, we started clearing this storage facility. Daniel Greer and his team find components to IEDs that look different than other things, and they knew we needed to take information, data, forensics on it. They called me and my teammate over, my teammate and I. We prosecute is what we called it. It's just a word we stole and used in a different way. We methodically go through the checklist of finding out what this is and how to document it and make sure we don't do it again. My teammate moves a conventional piece of United States ordinance that the enemy had recovered off the battlefield and was trying to make a bomb out of. He picks it up, puts it on his shoulder, moves it from a storage building to a behind a small wall, just a waist-high wall that kind of made a courtyard 10 meters away, 20 meters away, across a back alley. I understood that piece of ordinance that he moved from earlier instruction in school could be very dangerous if you moved it. We call that a no-mover. He probably never saw that piece of ordinance in school. He did not see it. I did. He picked it up and moved it. I told him how dumb he was in Marine Corps fashion for moving it. A lot of four-letter words. And, uh, and he kind of walked away because he understood we both need to cool off. And identifying that piece of ordinance as a potential hazard, I felt the responsibility to go inspect it and see if that hazard was there or if it was an empty shell. I walked over, shined a flashlight in it, leaned over the wall. He had done the right thing, what we would normally do, put it on the backside of that wall so if something did happen, there was something there to push the blast and shrapnel away. I leaned over to see if it had fusing and, and um, explosive material in it. 
And I don't remember what I saw because when I took a step to the right away from it, I stepped on an IED we didn't know was there. Um, and that's kind of what happened. It was to the right side of my body. It blew me through the air. I landed on my back and my legs were gone. Um, my right arm was all but severed and my left arm was twisted behind my back. As a matter of fact, in the moment, I didn't know if it was there anymore. I couldn't feel it. And I kind of went through the checklist of, okay, I can't put a tourniquet on because when I reached up with my right hand, my elbow came up, my hand stayed in my lap. My left arm's either not there or not there in any kind of meaningful way. My legs are gone. What can I do? I can make sure the Marines that are coming to help me and the guy next to me don't step on a bomb themselves. So I, in my mind, started trying to communicate with them. Finally, a Marine got to me and started trying to work on me. And he hadn't been there very long. I'd been there months longer than he had. He was nervous. It was his first incident like this. I'd seen this happen a dozen times, just not to me. And so finally, I said, look, more guys are coming. Quit trying to put tourniquets on because you're wasting my tourniquets is kind of what I was thinking. And I said, just say the Lord's Prayer with me. And we got started. And I always tell this joke. People think it's rehearsed and not true, but it is. It's like our father who art in heaven with liberty and justice for all. And we realized in that moment, <laughs> you know, maybe we should have went to church a time or two. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my. Oh, that's not funny. But it is. if you're not hearing the Benny Hill soundtrack right then. <laughs> that's right. That's right. I mean, here you are. Yeah. You're you're down two and a half limbs. It's got to be the most surreal frightening moment of your life it sounds like you were completely conscious and present though yes and you start to forest gump your way through the lord's prayer did the guy did the guy with you know it did either of you know it? no he didn't i did the liberty and justice part to make fun of the fact we were stumped after about two lines you know and and i said listen just and, and it got a little serious i said listen tell these people i love them and you know, check on Greer because he was the guy with me and he, he, I thought he was just knocked out. He wasn't bleeding or missing limbs. He was 20 feet away from me. The truth of it is he had been, he had been injured and his head had been injured and it took his life. And, um, and so they, they usually carry the most hurt person out first. And when I saw him go by before they got me out of there, I knew something wasn't right, but it hadn't quite registered. My eyes ended up swelling shut. Like I, you might get this mic just a little bit. Somebody in your listening audience will. My lips felt like they'd been blown open from the inside out. So when I'm telling this to a maybe a group down in Southern California, I'd be like, it felt like a full syringe, you know, and they get it. They get where <laughs> I'm going in that. And so, um, so yeah, my face felt, I thought my face had been blown off. I really was. I thought my face, and it was just the blast had, had busted every blood vessel in my face is what it was. And so when you're hurt and you're, when you're hurt in so many different places, you don't feel all of it at once. And so going through my mind at the time wasn't, will I live or will I die? It was, am I helping these guys to where if I die, they don't carry that responsibility? Am I communicating with them properly? Can I keep my head straight? I'd seen so many guys going to shock, and then I saw this Doc Wood get his legs blown off to the point he knew he was going to die. And, and I didn't see it happen firsthand. I, I arrived on scene right after they flew him out, and all the Marines were talking about how Doc Wood was conscious, and he was telling them basically what to do. And when he got to where he couldn't really think that straight, he was just giving them his blood type so they would remember and what it was, and what I realized even before I got blown up was, he didn't want those Marines feeling responsible because they they were taking care of the doc and they didn't have the knowledge he was supposed to have. He didn't want those Marines feeling like they let him down. Mm. So he was communicating to them knowing he was going to die. I mean, his legs were blown off to his pelvis. There was nowhere to put a tourniquet. And he bled out and passed away. But in his last act on this earth, he saved the sanity of four Marines working on him. And I didn't think I had that in me. And I, I didn't, but I had my version of it, which was to tell a joke or keep the guy busy, focused on telling my mama I love her because he wasn't going to be the guy that got my tourniquets on, right? And I knew that, but I knew more Marines were coming. I don't know if I thought I was going to die. I just thought I was living in that moment, and we both had a job to do. His was to take care of me, and mine was to make him feel like he did. First time I saw you on Fox News, um, I really liked you. I mean, and then like, I mean, I, ju like, I just like so much <laughs> now, now, now that I'm getting to know you, Joey, I don't know. Jury's out. No, you, <laughs> you, you, you remind me of my friend, Travis Mills. Um, yeah, Travis is a good one. I mean, but, but the interesting thing about some people who have endured the level of calamity that you guys have endured is, um, I can't really speak for anybody but me, but I, I stopped seeing your prosthetic legs about two minutes after uh, watching you. And you were wearing short pants, right? Yeah. I mean, it, it was like, there was no pretense. There was, and so I, I, I very quickly 
just didn't notice them anymore. Same thing happened with Travis. That doesn't happen with everybody I meet who has uh, survived this level of injury. So I think that's interesting. But I, but I brought it up because after the segment, I Googled you. And I found, I think it was CBS had footage of you mm-hmm. being taken to the helicopter. Yeah. You were on a stretcher. And, and guys are running with you. And that that just made it so real for me, just as a guy who, once again, hear the, the, the power and the wonder of this infernal device, yeah. right? I just wanted to have a second screen experience to see who the hell is this Johnny Joey Jones guy. And there you were on a stretcher without your legs getting saved by your by your buddies. Have you seen that footage? I'm sure you must have. And what's it what's it feel like to watch that? Well, I have seen it. I've seen it a million times at this point because uh, sometimes I go back and watch it to remind myself I'm lucky to be here. Um, it's it, we all get jaded. Like you, you know, I don't say anything I don't believe, but to say that I believe it 24 seven would be a lie. You know, there are days that just kind of suck, but you have to remember it's the days that suck that make the days that don't suck that much better. And so I've, I used to go back and watch it to, rem, to remind myself the events of that day to make sure I didn't mess up facts or cloud things. And I'm a firm believer that how we remember something is more important than how it happened because that's how it affects us right now in this moment. So I quit doing that. And if I mess up a fact, it's not intentional, you know, you know, you can plagiarize and become the president who cares. And so, um, <laughs> so I, I have seen it over and Careful over again. There, Johnny because, Joe Jones, you slipped this challenge <laughs> just a little bit. I, uh, I've watched it because I want to remember the emotion on those men's face that they interview. Because I have to remind myself it's possible for a grown man to love another man he's barely even met because that's how I need to feel. I need to feel like I love these people that irritate me in the airport because they ask me how much my legs cost or they ask Mm -hmm. me, you know, a question that I deem stupid and they meant genuinely. And I have to remind myself that these people cared that day because they saw what happened to me. And it's the exact same care that lives in those people that come up to me in the airport. (laughs) And I have to remind myself that if that responsibility lands on my shoulders to take somebody from a dire situation, a car wreck or what have you, um, or somebody passes out on the sidewalk, I have to remind myself I have the responsibility to be there for them because there were men there for me and, and women. There was a female uh, corpsman or doctor I don't remember there on site that day. And so I've watched it over and over again, but not out of vanity, not to be like, you know, look what I survived. But to remind myself how many people it took to get me off that battlefield and keep me alive.